Greetings again in Jesus' name. You know, we live in a world of mass deception. Everything's opposite of what it appears to be. It seems that way with politics, media, religion, the whole gamut. And we've got a bunch of slick-talking professionals out there, the smooth, swelling words of emptiness, promising people liberty in their sins with this myth myth mythical justification in sin penal substitution nonsense that they invented back in the Reformation 500 years ago, beginning with the faith alone, uh, sola fia nonsense of Martin Luther. Still upheld as one of the greatest theologians that ever lived, even though he participated in the brutal persecution of the Anabaptists in the 1500s. I'm not saying they were 100% correct in their doctrine. I'm just saying that persecution is of the devil. And so are anybody that participates in it, or approves of it, or is complicit to it. But nevertheless, I just want to, again, one of our topics that we've been over many, many times before, faith versus the law. I just want to point out a few things, maybe I haven't pointed out before, and go over many of the things that we've been over a hundred times before. You just can't seem to go over this enough without getting another person from the system that seems to watch this video on somebody's YouTube or somebody's Facebook and, and it's out there on the internet and they, and they look at this and they say, oh, he's preaching works. You know, you, you're not saved by this. You're, you're saved by... And get in the same remarks over and over again. Well, if I could do that, I'd save myself. Or if I could stop sinning, I wouldn't need Jesus. And, and all the same things repeated over, like parrots, like, like I did in the repeat after me section. We see Romans 1.17, very familiar verse, that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, and the just shall live by faith. Romans 1.17, quoting Hosea 6.6. 6. The interesting thing about Hosea 6.6 6 is in the Old Testament, faith, if you type that into the concordance, you'll find that the word faith only appears a couple of times, one of them in uh, Isaiah 6, Hosea 6.6. 6. rest of the time, the word faith in the Hebrews uh, translated faithfulness, steadfastness, and steadiness. Much the same as it means in the Greek, but of course that's been lost with the Solophia nonsense of the preachers that uh, expound this, that have the ear of most of, them, of, most of the world through their massive uh, uh, multimedia exchanges and money that they have behind it. But it's translated faithfulness most of the time in the scriptures. In other words, Hosea is saying that a just man shall live by his faithfulness to God. That's what it means. So understanding that the base word of faithfulness is connected with deeds, synonymous with deeds, we move into every professed Christian knowing that the, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. We see that in Paul's writings, right? See, what they don't understand, however, is that real faith upholds and establishes the law by the working principle of love. Those scriptures they don't memorize. The scriptures they memorize are about Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ, because by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Of course, the Judaizers were coming into the, Galat the area of uh, Galatians and telling them they had to keep the law. Thus we have the book of Galatians. And again in 3.11 he says, saying, No one is justified in the sight of God by the works of the law, for the just shall live by faith. There it is again. There's Hosea 6.6. 6. He means faithfulness to God's commands. Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in its sight. They know those verses. And that's the ones that the parrots in the pulpits repeat and repeat and repeat. As though you can be justified by nothing other than a trust in God, this finished work of Christ, this supposed substitutionary nonsense that they invented, and that covers you past, present, and future. And in most cases, you're eternally secure, although some uh, doctrinal statements say they don't believe that, but they might as well, because they got everybody living in sin anyway. But the Bible also says, the same guy that says this, see, the same Paul that said these things about by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified. He said in Romans 3.31, and I don't think I've ever heard any preacher in a parrot in the pulpit repeat this, do we make void the law through faith? God forbid. On the contrary, we establish the law. 
I know I've never heard any of the major pundits say this. Never. They would never touch this. Just like Martin Luther would never touch the book of James. He says it was the epistle of straw. So he burned, removed from the Bible, like he was burning his opposition. But no, it, it doesn't make void the law. Just like Christ said, he didn't come to make void, to do away with it. He come to establish it, to uphold it. Same words used here. So faith, working by love, purify the heart, upholds and establishes the law because law, love does no harm, Romans 13.10. So love is the fulfillment of the law, Paul says. There's that working principle. He said in Galatians 5.6, faith worketh by love. Circumcision or uncircumcision means nothing. Right before that, okay, in that verse. In other words, the law means nothing. What matters is a faith that works by love, by the principle of love. That's going to it's going to purify that heart of sin and return you to obedience to God. Circumcision, the uncircumcision is nothing in 1 Corinthians 7:19. See, again, the law, he's saying. Same thing again, like he said to the Galatians, he said to the Corinthians, if you get circumcised or uncircumcised, it doesn't matter. What, what matters is keeping the commandments of God, he told them in that verse. Where he was telling be all things to all men, in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 21, he said, he went on to say that not being without the law towards God, but rather under the law towards Christ. What law? The law of love. To love God. Like he said in Matthew 22, 37 through 39, to love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and your neighbor as yourself. And on that hangs all the law and the prophets. But no, you never hear those things in the churches. You hear them from those of us crying out in the wilderness here on the internet. But the people that need to hear it most desperately are not hearing it. And most of the time they just reject it anyway. See, because real faith, again, we've been over it how many times? Real faith works by love, Galatians 5, 6. Obedience to the faith purifies the heart, 1 Peter 1, 22. Faith has victory over the sin, the flesh, and the devil, 1 John 5, 4, and 5. So deeds count in justification. Deeds count in justification. You're not justified in your sins. Romans 4 don't teach that. Romans chapter 4, unless you just take those verses and you say, well, blessed is the man to whom God imputes uh, righteousness apart from works and who does not impute sin and whose sins are covered. Well, yeah, blessed is the man who repented, whose heart there was no guile. Read Psalm 32. David said he'd come clean with God in Psalm 32 for that awful sin. In whose heart there is no guile, meaning there was no insincerity, there was no sneakiness. There was no, well, I can get away with it next time because I can just say 1 John 1, 1.9, right? Of course, he didn't have 1 John 1, 1.9, but see, the people in the church, that's their idea. Well, if I get drunk this week, I can just confess it. You might as well be a Catholic then. Just, just get your absolvement there in the Eucharist or the confession to the priest. See, that's, that, that's all it was about. It's nonsense. So in that sense that having victory over the sin, the flesh, and the devil, and purifying the heart. I remember when I first, it, it just occurred to me, when I first ran across this concept way back, when I was still in the church, and I couldn't answer everybody's objection, and I didn't know a whole lot, because I came in from nothing. I just came in, like I've told you before, reading, reading the scriptures, my wife and I, and we, we came to a, you know, diligently, see, we believe God, okay, believe that God exists, we always did, never not believe that God exists. And He rewards those that diligently seek Him. Well, He rewarded us with an opportunity to, to come clean with Him. And since then, we've, we've served Him together in, in, in trying to convey this truth to others. But when I seen this truth in the Scriptures and tried to convey it to the Sunday school classes and the pastors, they were clueless of what I meant. They were clueless. I was so frustrated to try to convey this to the classes and sometimes I had opportunity to speak into the study groups, but they were clues. They're, they're just a blank look on their face because they'd never heard it before. They didn't know this was in the Bible. Most of the time, I've met the Bible study groups in these churches. They don't even know. They know Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but they don't know verse 10, that you're saved unto good works. I've had people say, what? <laughs> they, they quickly turned to that Ephesians. 
I didn't know that was there. See, they have their Bible laying in their lap while the preacher is humming along in his little parrot uh, sermon, and they don't even look what it says. Because why? Because it's ink on a page to somebody without the Spirit, and they don't have the Spirit. See, I didn't understand that then, but I understand that now. See, they were all saved in their sins under the lie, so they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They had a form of godliness, a form of religion. Big pretend thing, you know, big circus. Big fun and games, but they didn't have the Spirit of God. And there was just that big contrast between us and them because we were in the light and they were in darkness and, and they just couldn't see it. Finally, with the, you know, of course, we had to part ways. As, as always is, is the case. So we have James. What's James saying? James 2, verses uh, 22 through 24, about Abraham's faith. After, you know, he, he goes on to repeat it there, faith without works. Do you see that faith was working together and with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect. In other words, complete. The word perfect means completed. And the scripture was fulfilled that Abraham believed God and it was accounted in him as righteousness. He was called the friend of God. Yes, the Genesis scripture was fulfilled in him because of his deeds of faith. Like it goes on to say in Romans 4 where that's, that's repeated in Romans chapter 4 about Abraham. And in verses 19 through 21, it talks about it. The deeds of the steps of faith. He did the deeds of faith, obeyed God, fully persuaded, fully confident. That's why it was imputed to him as righteousness then, it says in Romans 4.22. And it says the same thing here. So in verse 24, he says, You see that a man is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. So the reformers are wrong. It's a fundamental error here. It's not just some simple little error about head coverings or, or uh, things about women and godliness that we just went over. No, it's a fundamental error that renders the gospel null and void. Because when you render repentance proven by deeds, void, you render the gospel void. Now, I preached a message a long time ago. I presented a message a long time ago about the demise of repentance. And I sent that to some pastors at the time. It was years ago. I still was in association with some of those dead church pastors thinking I could wake them up. And he wrote back to me. He said, well, oh, this is the demise of the gospel. See, he couldn't understand. See, he couldn't connect the things because, why? Because he bought the lie. See, the lie is strong delusion, no doubt. And it's been enforced and immersed into the minds of man, pounded into his brains for 500 years. So now you got everybody, the radio hosts and the celebrities and all these people and football players and the sporting people, they're all saved. They're all Christians living a completely vile life. Drunkenness, fornication, pornography, you got the whole gamut involved here. Divorces and just total, complete ruin. But they're saved. And people look up to them, buy their books. <sighs> Off track here. So man is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. The Bible says that, okay? That's what James, the brother of Christ, said. Where did he learn that? Well, he learned that from his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Romans chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, is not teaching that a man is justified in his sins apart from any works, apart from any deeds. Yeah, he's apart from the works of the law, yes. But by the law of faith, just like it says in Romans 3, 27, he says, what is a boasting then? Is it excluded by what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Well, what's the law of faith? How many times do we have to say it? Love. Faith worketh by love. That's the law of faith. An obedient heart, purified in repentance, proven by deeds. So the law cannot save. Why can't the law save? These Judaizers coming in, telling them they had to keep the law, you had to be circumcised, had to uh, appear to Jewish customs. That's what they were telling them then. In Galatians and Rome and, and the rest of Asia. No, the law can't save because once it's willingly and presumptuously violated, it brings death. Right? Romans 6.23, wages of sin is death. It's the gift of God. It's eternal life. So there's no reprieve for deliberate sin under the law. Look at Moses' law in Numbers 15, verses 30 and 31. Presumptuous or 
intentional sin, whichever you like to call it there. Unintentional sin they sacrificed for. There was no sacrifices for deliberate sin. Think, of, think about it. There, when they made sacrifices in the atonement, it was for unintentional sins. Those some slip-ups, mistakes, not for deliberate sins of fornication and adultery and drunkenness. No, those sins that brought death. Just like Hebrews chapter 10 says in verses 26 through 31. Under the law of Moses, under two or more witnesses, that's it. You were dead. So if a person just merely then returned to obedience to the laws, well, I won't do it again, Moses. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll obey now. No, it can't remit the past sin and purify the heart because there's no working principle in the person of love. He's going to violate it again. We see that all the time. The, the people of Israel went through the, ri the ritual washings and the ceremonies, and it couldn't wash away their sins or regenerate their spirit, so Moses had to plead time and again with God that he not destroy them. We see in Deuteronomy tw two significant instances where God was going to wipe them all out and start over because of their sin, but Moses interceded. That's remission. That's mercy passing over those sins. And that's what grace is about, as, as we'll see here. I'll show you. So that's why Paul kept expressing in the Scriptures the true intent of God's law being justice, mercy, and faith. Like Jesus told the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 23. All of that working in a person that loves God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. Like he, Moses told that the principle was there under Moses. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Check it out. He told them to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, their neighbor as herself. Repeated in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The same thing. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's it. That's it. And if that doesn't require deeds, I don't know what does. See, real faith, a person can return to obedience with his conscience purged from those dead works by the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9.14 how much more shall his offering, his blood offering, purge your conscience of dead works so you can return to obedience out of love with a heart purified by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's why the people in the church, in the mess, in the apostate condition, they don't have the Spirit. There's no possibility for them to be anything but what they are, carnal and carnally minded. So they interpret and understand the scriptures in the carnal mind. It's the same in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. These things are spiritually discerned. You have to have a spirit to the carnal mind, to the worldly mind. None of these things can be understood. Like I said, it's just ink on a page. So you have to be purged of those dead works. The washing and the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, like Titus 3.5 says. That's true justification. So the law of faith, Romans 3.27, is expressed in the deeds of faith that are initialized in repentance by laying aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receiving with meekness the implanted word that's able to save the soul. James 1.21 and 22. Being a doer of the word and not a hearer only, self-deceived, being just to hear the word under this faith alone, reform nonsense, you're self-deceived, thinking that you can be justified in your sin because of the, another, the second fundamental error, that you are inbred with your sin, it's your nature at birth, your entire essence is sin, you can never do anything, you have no ability, you're incapable of any deeds worthy of repentance, it's all filthy rags, Therefore, the lie of justification in sin, it instills only the faith of devils, like James 2.19 said. They believe and tremble. Believe, same word as faith. They believe and they tremble. It's the same thing. That, well, you don't even tremble. You, have, you don't even have the, the sense to tremble at God's commands. And you think you're okay, the people in the, under that mess. So man remains then carnal, sold under sin, believing erroneously that he's in right standing with God. And everything's fine and dandy. He has the blessings of the Lord. He mistakes the blessings of you know, living in a free society, in a relatively free society, is losing it pretty quick, with the blessings of God. But that's the blessings of allowing you time to repent, like Romans 2.4 says. But you despise that by believing this lie that you're justified already. 
So you're carnal, sold in your sin. You're in the Romans chapter 7 state constantly. But preachers tell you that's, that's fine and dandy. That's every Christian. His flesh is corrupt and he can't do what's right and blah, 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 blah. So you, you buy that lie. But see, that's a man that's been taken captive by sin that's trying to do the right thing, knows what's right, but he's taken captive by sin. He's under that addiction of sin. You've got to break free from it through repentance. That's why you've got to bring forth deeds worthy of repentance. It's the word you're not going to hear defined or talked about within the apostate system of the church. Your Bible study groups and your, your gatherings and your, and your sermons. See, worthy means in the scriptures, deserving as something of merit, having worth and value. And excellence, the equivalent and with of before the thing deserved. In other words, the definition meaning doing something of merit towards a goal of considerable worth. That's what it means. Here you're obeying God, where he says, bring forth deeds worthy of repentance. Jesus told only those worthy would enter his kingdom, like in uh, Luke 20, 35, in 962, where he talks about putting your hand to the plow. And again, in uh, Matthew 10, 37 and 38. You're not worthy if you don't take up your cross. You don't love me more than your family, more than your loved ones. Then you're not worthy of me. But see, nobody tells you that type of thing. That's why the Scripture tells you that constantly you're going to be judged according to your deeds done in faith. But see, you're not going to be judged according to anything because He took your place. It's all been said. It's not an example. It's just substitution under that lie. But the scriptures are very clear. There, there, there's 12 to 14 scriptures that talk about you're judged according to your deeds. Jesus said a number of times, two notable ones are Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, that God is going to re-render to each one according to his deeds. According to his deeds, done in faith. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey on righteousness, indignation, and wrath. And he repeats it again in the next verse. Couldn't be more clear. The very last thing that Jesus says in the Bible, and to John, he, he recorded in Revelation 22, verses 12 through 14. He says, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to each one according to his work. Just like he promised in John 5, where he talked about the resurrection of evil or condemnation whether you've done evil or good. On the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, blessed are those who do His commands that they will have the right to the tree of life and to enter into the, king, the gates of the city. But outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, you know, the very next verse. Yeah, exactly right. Now don't let anybody tell you the reward is just some system of rewards that they created because of this nonsense they believe. No, the reward is eternal life, folks. The reward is eternal life. So what about the free gift then? Well, how can you lose this free gift? If you give it to free, how can I give it back? Well, you ruined it. That's why. See, the gift, you don't understand what the gift is. The gift is remission of past willful sin. Just like he passed over the sins of Israel on many occasions when they repented and pleaded with him and came clean, even if it was just a remnant of them. Here again, under re granted repentance to life. In other words, you're given the opportunity to repent, to pass over your willful past sins. That's what remission, remission is mercy. It's not a license for future sin. See, that's the lie under this substitution, everything done in advance nonsense. It's not past, present, and future sin. No. It's past sin. Grace is not unmerited favor. It's loving kindness of God to pass over sins previously committed, Romans 3.25. That's what grace is. Not license to keep on sinning because all i got to do is confess, sin, repent, sin, repent. No. That's not in, that's, you're not in Christ if that's all, you're, all you've ever done. See, grace cannot be abused or received in vain, as the Scripture talks about. Receive not the grace of God in vain, meaning without purpose and to no effect. Well, there's no effect if you've never stopped sinning. If you're still willfully sinning against God, willfully rebel, in rebellion. See, in other words, grace is power, actually. It's, the word's chariz, 
the power by which man can escape the corruption that's in the world through lust and live a godly life in this present age, like Titus 2.14 says. That's the grace of God with your passions and desires crucified in repentance proven by deeds. Repentance and faith proven by deeds. Those in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So that's the gift. Remission of our past sins. We can't forgive ourselves. We can't do anything about that. That's where we get the mercy. We go to the mercy seat in broken repentance and self-cleansing humility to receive that remission of past sin, to be reconciled to God, return to favor. So we can be cleansed of our past sins, purified within, so we'll obey God. See, the law was weak in that it could not bridle the out-of-control indulgences of the flesh. See, in willful rebellion to God, it meant instant death of the spirit. The day that you eat of that fruit, you will die, right? It's the same thing. It only takes one, one sin. It's not a continue, you've got to keep doing, you've got to keep, you keep getting drunk. And, no, no. One, one willful sin. It only took one sin in the garden. See, under, under the law, as I pointed out and alluded to, there were rare instances of the people that found grace in the eyes of the Lord by departing from their evil ways, amending their evil ways, ceasing to do evil, learning to do good, as the prophets uh, beseeched them to do, getting themselves a new heart and a new spirit to go and sin no more, like Ezekiel 18, verses 31 and 32 says. There was rare instances of that. Now Christ offers us through that sin offering on the cross, not a substitution, an offering on the cross, repentance unto life, an opportunity to repent, to be reconciled, to return to favor with God through repentance for remission. That's why he told him, go forth and preach repentance for remission, Luke 24, 47. See, under grace we have this reprieve. We have this patience and long-suffering. But if you abuse it, you will suffer the consequences. See, that's the goodness and the forbearance and the long-suffering of God that gives us time to repent. Time to repent. It's, it's like that verse says there. It says, Are you despised the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance for remission, right? So you can be remitted. But in accordance to the hardness of your heart, your impenitent heart, you are storing up for yourself wrath against the day of wrath for yourself and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render each one according to his deeds. And I read you that. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good. See, that's, that's the reason you experience the providential blessing of God to some degree. Because he's long-suffering. He's giving you space to repent. But abused, to, to abuse this, then you will not escape the judgment of God. You exchange the truth of God for a lie, that you can sin and not die. You can be justified in your sins, and then you go under strong delusion under that mess. See, nobody's going to appear before the great judgment of God, the great judgment seat of Christ, in their filthy rags with a desperately wicked heart chief of sinners, as you're being taught in the churches. No. No, in the scriptures it said his bride is making herself ready in the garments of righteousness with a faith working by love, purifying the heart from the corruption of sin and upholding the law of love. That's what the scriptures teach. We've been over, we've been over those scriptures. The Revelation 19.70 says his bride made herself ready. The garments of righteousness, the robes of white. Not a cloak. It's not the righteous. You're not cloaked with the righteousness of Christ, clothed with the right. That's another myth that they parrot in the pulpits. There's no verse in the Bible for it. Because it's faith that's imputed as righteousness, and faith obeys. See, deeds imply ability. The Bible's asking you if a man can perform deeds as implied by asking him to bring forth deeds worthy of repentance, then he can stop sinning and seek God in a self-cleansing humility that's described over and over again in the Scriptures. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Then he seeks the mercy of God, right? It's described that way over and over, given that man has the ability to stop sinning. Not to save himself, but to come to remission 
Mercy. See, the justification in sin, not of deeds and not of works, myth, is derived from the false premise that God's man is born in sin, morally depraved, and incapable of deeds of any merit towards God. And therefore, in their minds, if you perform any deeds of any merit whatsoever, you're lost. So they're going to go and they're going to plead at the judgment seat that well, I, I didn't want to abuse your grace by trying to earn it. See, they don't understand any of the concept because it's never been brought to the minds of people for hundreds of years. So under their principle then, if you can stop sinning, you can save yourself, you wouldn't need Christ. So there you have the counterfeit gospel in a nutshell. Preached for the last 500 years that we've summarized for you. The result then are very few are coming out of this lie and being genuinely saved from their sins. We see very few. Some do. Thank God. Praise God for His power. See, it's not prideful. It's not self-righteous to perform deeds worthy of repentance towards salvation. That's what worthy means to begin with. See, you're not saving yourself when you're obeying God and stopping your vile sins is not being as perfect as God. See, you're under a delusion that you think that that's what is happening. So therefore, you buy into the other system of substitution, well, because you want to keep sinning. That's as simple as that. Like one brother keeps telling me in our study, they just love to keep sinning. They don't want to stop. So they don't enter into this relationship with Christ where they can be cleansed and purified and regenerated in spirit, have their mind and their bodies healed, their souls renewed in Christ. See, He can heal you of these maladies in your mind, this insanity that you have to go after, this ruination behavior that you're in. And that's all it is. The, the uncontrollable lust of the flesh, be it whatever, be it the, the lust of pornography, be it the lust of the, uh, the adultery or homosexuality or whatever it is, it's ruination. It's going to destroy you and destroy your soul. So the only way out is through this repentance. And that's what we keep trying to repeat again and again. So do so and seek God that way and repent. It's my website at standinggap.org and all the PDF files and the help files. And if you have any questions, you can email me on my Holy Fernley account. I'll be glad to answer, I'll be glad to help. So those of you I commend you to the grace of God that are out there fighting, contending for the truth, that are upholding the truth. These petty differences that divide us over the different things that we've posted up on the internet, well then so be it. There's, there's really nothing more I can say or do. I just ask you to learn, to open your mind, open your heart to knowledge, to the scriptural understanding, the reference, and why things were said. But if you never do that, you never do that. But obey God and keep your heart pure, guard your heart, and steadfast.